You want to stick around and watch the game? <laughs> Not a fucking chance. No. It's game six. The Celtics. We're going. Welcome back to the official Winning Time podcast from HBO. I'm Rodney Barnes, executive producer on the show. We played like sissies. I don't know how else to put it. When I'm in pain like this, I take it out on punk ass white boys. No! Unfinished business! As always, we start the episode breaking down fact and fiction with Jeff Perlman, author of the book that inspired our series. Then I talk through the season finale's key scenes with my good friend, director, and executive producer, Sally Richardson Whitfield. To finish, we speak with costume designer Emma Potter, the woman behind the groovy clothes and retro uniforms we see on this season's superstars. But before that, we've got a little recap. This episode is titled, What Is and What Should Never, and it's directed by Sally. It opens the same way the season started, with the Lakers winning the first game of the 1984 finals against the Celtics. But their advantage doesn't last long. The Lakers fight through injuries, sweltering stadiums, and dirty tricks before succumbing to Larry Bird and the Boston Celtics in Game 7. A quick note. Some of these scenes, moments, and instances are fictional. We add them to tie facts together and weave a narrative. Again, some things are fictional, but they're inspired by true events. All righty, let's do this. Our first guest, Jeff Perlman. We know Jeff because he is the author of Showtime, the book in which this show is based on. Jeff, thank you for joining us once again. Sure. So let's talk playing the Boston Celtics in Boston in the 80s. You know, you hear a lot of stories, you know, how our back played with the temperature and the water. And What was it like for real? Are there any nuances to this idea, or was it just that? Always just that. I mean, Red Auerbach was, a, depending on your perspective, either a brilliant tactician yes. or a evil genius right and he was just i'm talking michael chiklis as uh red Auerbach in the show nails it nails who he was nails his behavior and nails his sort of desire to win i mean that guy was addicted to winning by all means necessary can we talk a little bit about the history of boston and how that connected to the fan base for me all i'd really known before the celtics was that malcolm x was in roxbury that's where he was from uh -huh. Other than that, it seemed like Boston was a really scary place to both be black in and to play the game of basketball. You know, we know the story about Bill Russell when people broke into his home, defecated in his bed. And this is Bill Russell, who's a hero. Yeah. So if you're going to treat your heroes that way, how are you going to treat the guys, you know, the visiting team? Can you talk about the specifics of racism as it, you know, applies directly to the city of Boston? Well, it's a really interesting city with a really interesting and in a lot of ways troubling history. There was this idea in the civil rights movement that everything needed to happen in the South and that mm -hmm. the North was okay because the North was open-minded and liberal. But quote-unquote liberal Northerners in many cities, Boston, one of the major ones, were doing everything they could to suppress black advancement. Mm -hmm. And busboy, okay, do I want you sitting next to me at a cubicle? Not really. And Boston had a lot of racial outbursts, a lot of violence through the years. Black players went out of their way not to play for the Celtics. Yeah, it was just a rough place. How much do you think it's changed? I, I honestly don't know. I'm sure there's still some of it there. I always think of Boston and Philly as sibling cities. Yeah, where they're just, spooky. They're edgy. Yeah. And they'll stab you with a piece of glass. I think a lot of these places, those kind of cities, it's like, yeah, we love Randall Cunningham, but like... You love him as long as he's playing well yeah, for you. Yeah, as long you. as he's got that uniform on. Yeah. Let's talk about Magic's relationship with Jerry West. In the show, we use Jerry West and the idea of him being a mentor to Magic. Mm. Did they have a special relationship? Was there a level of intimacy to it? I wouldn't say, like, super, super special. 
What I think is interesting about the relationship is how it evolved. I mean, when you think about the start of this series and the start of that era, he did not want Magic Johnson as a Laker. He thought at six foot nine, this guy's too big of a point guard. It wouldn't make sense. He's gonna, how is he going to dribble? Blah blah blah. So over time, I think Jerry West really came to appreciate the talents of Magic, also the intensity of Magic, and also the intellect of Magic. So over time, that relationship really kind of blossomed. It's not like they're best friends, but there was certainly a mentor e type thing as Magic really started to establish himself as a star. We have a moment in this episode where Larry Bird tells the press, we played like sissies. Yeah. Do you think this served as a rallying cry to his teammates, or did they resent the fact that they were being outed in this way? Well, first of all, I think he really felt like his team was playing like a bunch of wimps. Larry Bird wasn't like, oh, I'm going to show these guys and motivate them by mm -hmm. saying to Bob Ryan of the Boston Globe mm -hmm. they were playing. But I think, like, there's something really impactful about the quiet guy who doesn't say a ton. Mm -hmm. And when he does say something, you're like, whoa. It rings louder. Definitely yeah. rings louder. And Bird was so quiet. And he was so clearly the best player on that team. And that was a good team that, like, when he spoke up, it resonates. One of the things that I thought was always kind of cool about Larry Bird is the shit talking. The best. Talk to me about your perspective of Larry Bird's trash talk. Is it unique in the annals of NBA history? Yes, I would say so, actually. All right, so you go back in time and trash talk, dating back to the playground to New York City, blah, yeah. blah, blah. It's like, I'm going to make you my bitch, right? That yes. was like standard trash talk. I'm going to make yeah, you my yeah. bitch, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that ain't creative. Right. Michael Cooper told me about this. Let's say whoever, Dennis Johnson's inbounding the ball, is two seconds left in the game, Bird's going to be like, yo, I'm going to catch the ball at the elbow. I'm going to pump fake you twice. I'm going to shoot, bank, game over. And Cooper was like, and then he would do it. Mm -hmm. Then he would do it. So Bird took trash talk to a super new level. And I will say, no one expected the white guy to be talking trash. And he didn't just do it. He'd be like, all right, watch this, man. Bam, did it. And then he'd just walk back and be like, I told you. It was just like cold. All right, so we're at a point where we're at the finals, Lakers Celtics. And we hit this point in the game when the Celtics decide they're going to get physical. Once the game becomes physical, it, it seems like it evens the playing field. So the Celtics basically rope dope the Lakers. They ran the old Ali Foreman rope dope mm -hmm. And Mikhail clotheslines Karamis driving to the hoop. Lakers get pissed. Celtics are kind of happy that someone finally stood up and did something. And all of a sudden, the Lakers are furious. And the Lakers decide they need to get more physical. You know, we're not going to let these guys blah, blah, blah. But that wasn't the Lakers' game. It's not game natural to who they at are. At all. And yeah. the Lakers, if you think about the Celtics and their lineup, Mikhail was a gritty player. Robert Parrish was a gritty player. Dennis Johnson was a gritty player. Bird was a gritty player. They were made for that. Right. And the Lakers played angry. And they played, we're going to get physical. We're going to show them. We're not going to take it. And for the Celtics, I was just like the gateway to victory. So I wouldn't say it just even the playing field. I think it tilted the playing field completely toward the Celtics. And probably more to the point was a reminder, this is how we need to play the Lakers. This is how we play them. We don't run with them. We're not trying to be them. Right. Let's be the opposite of them and it's set a blueprint to go forward. And I thought as a storyline, it really did create not just a basketball game, but a story within the game. Definitely. And it also made it personal when you would see your team getting beaten physically. Mm -hmm. The physicality of the fouls and that type of thing. And today, what you would call a flagrant two or get ejected for, you could punch somebody in the face and just get a tech. Kevin McHale, that's one of the, the worst fouls I've ever seen. And Kevin McHale was not ejected from that game. No. Yeah. And no. I'm kind of glad he wasn't. Like, No, no, you didn't want him to. Yeah. Lakers Celtics was legit hate. Big time. Laker fans hated Celtics. Celtics hated the Lakers. You had to take a side. If you were living in Nebraska or Kansas or Mail Pack, New York, or wherever you live, you were picking Lakers or Celtics. If you were a Sixers fan, you were probably siding with the Lakers because you hated the Celtics. If you were a Warriors fan, you wanted the Celtics because you hate the Lakers. During this period as well, Kareem had this migraine. Mm -hmm. It started to be a regular thing. It felt like Kareem and migraines. Mm -hmm. What was the significance of the migraine? I get migraines sometimes, and they're bad, and it sucks, and you lie in bed in the dark for a while. With Kareem, they were not just mild migraines. They were, I can't see. My head feels like it's exploding. I need to vomit. I need a million pounds of ice on my head. It was debilitating. So they didn't happen with enough frequency that the Lakers would be like, all right, Swen Nader, you're playing tonight. Right. But it was a, when it happened, it was a real problem, and you were always on sort of, you'd show up at the arena that night just hoping Kareem wasn't having a migraine. Celtics win. 
They're champions now. Yep. Now the Lakers have to get off the floor. Yep. And the Celtics fans are attacking our Laker players. Yeah, that's no good. Was that real? It did really How intense it. was it, Jerry? It was intense. It was like um, the Celtic fans storm, and they see basically two things. They're Celtic heroes who they love, and they see these Lakers who they hate. And if you watch a video of that, I mean, the Lakers are, like, furious and terrified at the same time. You know, like, you are, you're the Lakers in this racist city surrounded by a thousand white people descending around you. That's, that's very frightening. In Celtic green. Yes. So, Jeff, we've come to the end of the season. What do you think about season two? I loved it. I thought it was great. I thought it was a really sort of interesting cast of characters. My biggest takeaway from a production side of it all, mm -hmm. I thought it found a real gem in Sean Patrick Small playing Larry Bird. Big time. Love Sean. He's yeah. a great guy. Love Sean. And he's great earnest. Guy. And loves Larry Bird. Like, naturally, he came to the table with a lot of Bird information, Correct. stuff, fan base, knowledge, all of that stuff. And I'll tell you something interesting. Last weekend, Sean drove down to my house and played in my Saturday pickup run. And he's a really good player. Sean's about 6'4", 30, he's 20 years younger than me. I can shoot. But the interesting thing is, you know, he worked with them on mm -hmm. looking like Bird, and now in games, he shoots like Bird. He has the exact same release in pickup in normal yeah. world as Larry Bird's release back in the 80s from, wow. from work on the show. And a bunch of the guys came down and watched the show with you. They did. For me, honest to God, just saying this sincerely, Yes. this has been a dream come true for me. This has been, In fact, I never had this dream. I just wanted to be a writer for Sports Illustrated. That was my goal in life. And if you had said to me back in college, one day they're going to take a book you write and they're going to turn it into an HBO show, not only that, it's going to star John C. Riley, it's going to star Sally Field, it's going to star all these people. And not only that, it's going to give all these young actors, Quincy Isaiah, and Solomon Hughes, and Sean, and a million different guys, that they're going to get this opportunity. It's been one of the joys of my life, and getting to know them, and getting to know you, and all that. I really mean that. It's been one of the joys of my life. Thank you. I really, really, really do appreciate you coming in here and doing this. This has been fantastic. Thank you, Rodney. So my next guest is my mean little sister. <laughs> Let's welcome executive producer and director Sally Richardson Whitfield. Well, I'm so happy you said little sister. <laughs> yeah, you're a little sister. I said little sister. And it's funny how your voice did that tonal shift. You remember this? Yeah. yeah, yeah there's yeah. a that <laughs> Mae West thing. It's like it became. I pulled out. I pulled out my voiceover. Yeah, voice. you did a thing because like a moment ago you were cussing at me and called me all kinds of names, and then all of a sudden you became somebody different. It's amazing. How does it feel being a veteran? having experienced season one, and now you come into season two with another title and more responsibility. You know, I said to myself, it's like giving birth mm. and you forget the pain so you have another one. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> wow. You like that? <laughs> Continue. Continue. Obviously, I am so honored, or I was so honored to be asked back in a bigger capacity. I do feel like I had something left to do coming back this season. Okay. There was more to explore. There was more basketball to do better and conquer in a different way. And you don't usually get that opportunity to come back. You know, okay, yeah. I've learned from last year. Now I really know how we can make this bigger. And so what a great opportunity to come back and be part of this team. We open this episode 208 with the HBO logo that I remember when we first got cable back in the day. The HBO documentary about the 1984 finals. The Lakers and the Celtics. So many memories, so many golden moments. The Celtics and the and footage Russell, that accompanied all of that. Whose idea was that? I would say that that idea came from me and Todd Van Hazel, our DP. We had some ideas along with you guys. No, it's all right. It's all right. You ain't got to give us credit. Go on. You know, because this kind of plays off of the first episode, too. Um, it was more about, like, really coming into the season with this energy and this pop 
almost like an action sequence. And I think that we were right. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't expect you to say anything else. Um, your partner in crime. Yes. Todd Van Hazel. Yes. Incredible director of photography slash director himself. Yes, this season. On the series. Would you like to speak to the nature of this macabre relationship that the two of you have formed? <laughs> well, I think that as directors, we all search for those people, especially your DP. That's, you know, that is your partner in crime when you're shooting that gets you and understands what's in your head and makes you better, has matches your energy. And Todd is that for me. And I think that you can't beat us. He feeds off of me. I feed off of him. I give, I say an idea and he's my yes, but there's never a no. It's a, we're just trying to make it better and better and dream bigger. So at the beginning of season two, we start with game one of the 84 finals. And then we bookend at the end, coming back where we started. Why was that decision made? Because, I mean, we were trying to tell a particular story this season. And it was short and compact. And we were jumping through seasons. And I think it just was the thing that made it make the most sense. Now we're back in episode eight. Yes. We're on the bus now, and Riley's talking to Magic. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, Coach, this right here feeling like a sweep. We landed the first punch, but they're back right now making adjustments. Game two, they're going to come out throwing haymakers. Yeah, well, whatever they do, whatever Larry do, I'm going to be ready. It's an odd thing because we've just won, mm-hmm. but yet Riley sees something in Magic in this moment that he needs to say without actually taking away from the moment of the victory. It's so funny because I think more about, honestly, where Quincy was, you know, and trying to find that, you know, when you have an athlete who, not smug. Yes. You know, but smug. Yeah. That we got it. Yeah. I'm good. I'm the best. Don't you worry. And Riley's coming from that experience. Yes. Of I see it. I've been there before. Yes. And I need to try to nip this in the bud. And unfortunately, (laughs) as in real life, it don't matter how much you tell a young person your wisdom, they never listen. They don't see it as wisdom. They see it as, you know, leave me alone. Yeah, I know what I'm doing. At the end of game two, magic freezes. Doesn't get the pass off in time. And we lose. Mm. You know, that choice of focusing in on him made it a choice about character Mm -hmm. and not a choice about basketball. It's not just about we lost the game and blah, 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 blah. We focused on magic in the moment. Why did you make that choice? Well, okay, first let's talk about if you see the actual play, it's not the most exciting play in the world. That's true. You almost don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. So I think, of course, that's when we have to try to figure out what happened. So I think the only thing we can assume is that he was so caught up in maybe Larry Bird. Mm -hmm. Because we know magic. Magic doesn't, like, forget time or what's going on. So somehow or another, you were so preoccupied with something that was not about this game in that moment that would have this happen. And so, again, being in his perspective as he is so focused on Bird... I could imagine that maybe that's where Magic's mind was. I wanted to speak to the nature of how basketball is shot on this show Mm. and the evolution of how basketball was shot. Because in season one, it almost felt like we're going to figure this out eventually. And in season two, the way you guys captured basketball was so beautiful. And this episode, which is heavily basketball And it is a championship, and there is a winner and a loser. Can you talk about how you and Todd were able to evolve how we do basketball on this show? Well, it was definitely a learning curve from last year, although I think that when I came in by the finale, we had started to figure some things out. Yeah, for sure. But I really think that it's a leaning 
into the narrative part of the game and mm-hmm. not just the basketball. We figured out how to get the plays down and focus on these beautiful moments. You know, as far as the basketball part of it, knowing that, okay, we have this dunk, we have this one pass. How can we do some really special shots to emphasize it, to add into our other tricks? But I think that focusing on those moments between Magic and Bird and really coming in there handheld into the game, we didn't do that so much last year, um, so that we can get in your face and feel those emotions really changed the basketball this season. And we did that, I would say, 50% more. We were able to get into that huddle and get more of just those looks. Sometimes it's Mm -hmm. not conversation. It's just really about getting the emotions of those looks. You never see in a game magic or Larry, you know, looking yeah. across from huddles. Yeah. And that speaks volume. So it's, it was really from last season going this year, we are going to lean into what no one has ever been able to see before is what is going on with these players in their head during the game. So we're in the tunnels with Magic and Cookie. Hey, Cook. Can you hang back for a minute? Not for a while. Oh, thanks. Oh. Why? Love you, Coop. I love you too. Or the what? What do you think that moment meant to both of them? Do you think Magic knew that he was going to end up taking this picture with Cookie and that Cookie was going to respond in a particular way? Or do you think it was just a moment? I think you can kind of tell from there's a a kitchen scene with Magic and the family. He is going through a lot emotionally. And sometimes you you only want to focus on what the task is at hand. And for Magic, that is basketball. And so there is a lot in that moment. And she can feel that something might be said to her. And what an awkward time to be caught in a photo. One of the best parts of the Johnson family being there to me is it seems like mom and dad know what to do because they've been in this position with him before. Cookie, not so much. Mm -hmm. And I thought that the subtlety of all of that and how you played that was really, really great because you rarely get to see that part of an athlete's life. You know, you see the arguments, you see when things go bad, you see when things go good, the celebration, but you don't see the nuance to the relationship. And I thought that was one of the high points, certainly of this moment, because she typically wouldn't be there. We haven't really shown her being a part of his life in a pivotal moment. He might call her on the phone and they talk about certain things, (laughs) but he's controlling that moment. Mm Mm-hmm. Because he can hang the phone up. He can up. hang the phone up. You know, but here she's there. And I think it's the first step to ultimately when they get married. Spoiler alert. But I think the nuance that you chose in that moment was perfect. It is hard to be married to a superstar. They had a couple of scenes that we cut out earlier in the season. But Cookie and Mom talking in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. You two set a date yet? Oh, no, no, not yet. There's just so much going on with the finals. I'm just trying to let him be. Not like I'm in any rush, so. You getting cold feet? No, no, oh. nothing like that, no. Do you think Cookie is cognizant of the fact that mom is sort of prodding as to what the future's going to be? Do you think she's assessing whether or not Cookie is prepared for this moment and what she's about to step into? Or do you think it's just curiosity? I think that mom feels something is going on with her son at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. And she's feeling out cookie to see if you feel in some of this. Yes. What's going on? Because she loves cookie. I don't care. She knows that this is the right woman for her son. Yes. Do you feel what I feel in the air? What is happening? Right. And I think that's mom trying to slowly kind of figure out, and I love you know, the what's way going on. She does it without being, yeah. like, overt. Yeah. There's a subtlety to it that opens the door to vulnerability mm-hmm. and her being able to express herself. Those scenes are written well. Later in the episode, we have Claire coming into Jeannie's office. 
We need to talk. Wow. New look. Um, Claire, have you met Jay? Hi. <laughs> yes! King's defenseman Jay Wells. Let me be the first to congratulate you on your new deal. Thanks. Hmm. Now get out. And beyond the reason that she walks in, she notices Jeannie's change, her look, the evolution. Because there's one energy when she walks in, because she gave the player the information and all of that stuff. From what she just heard, you've just done some really, you know, craziness. Mm -hmm. You're giving information to a player, and now I'm walking in, and you are like sitting over the top of him in your office. This feels very bus-like. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what she's noticing. This person is becoming her father. And obviously, as a woman, you can tell if somebody's had a makeover. Like, that is a completely different woman who yeah, turns Yeah, it's not in, the same. Yeah, it's no, not the same. So you're like, yeah. wait a minute, what's happening? And then you have this mixture of, oh, I see this little girl is growing up to be the woman that she should be. Right. And that I know that she can be, that we ended with somewhat last season. She's becoming who I said you were going to be in the first place. Not just daddy's little girl, but right. taking over everything. After the game two loss, Magic and Jerry West talk about what went wrong. Let's play the clip. It's these new dudes. They ain't been here before. Come on. My six finals, I was just as good as Russell. But every single fucking time, every single time shit broke his way. Some fucking no name would hit a fucking shot from fucking nowhere. But you see, Bill, he had a way of making those no-names contribute. For as me, I was too busy focused on me. I took whatever they gave me. And that was my mistake. Is that going to be yours? Why do you think Jerry West was the right person to deliver that message to Magic? He's been there. Mm -hmm. And he made those mistakes. Right. You cannot do it on your own. No superstar can. It's a team at the end of the day. It's a team. And if you don't bring your brothers into the fight, you can't win it by yourself. I just love these two together. This scene, I love this scene. There's an honesty to it. Yes. And honestly, I think this is one of our best, like, talking about basketball scenes where you understand the heart of these players and the struggle that they go through. I really love this scene. And I think it's also more powerful the way it lands on Magic because it's coming from superstar Jerry mm -hmm. West, the logo. Yeah. Pat Riley could say the same thing, and it might land logically, but that ability from superstar to superstar to communicate to one another, mm -hmm. I think sort of drives it home with a little bit more intensity. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about West's character this yeah. season. You get this growth from more of a hothead to someone who is part of making this team what it becomes. After Game 3, we have a scene with Jerry Buss and Claire Rothman where she's learning about his divorce and <laughs> all of the implications that come with it and the new cable deal. She's in, on a high coming into the scene, but quickly goes to a low. This is not something you have to worry about. This is my problem. Your problem? It's in my life! If I oversee another bankruptcy, they're not gonna let me run a high school gym, Jerry! I will lose everything I've worked for! Can you speak to Claire Rothman's evolution in that scene in particular? You know, it's so funny. Now, that particular scene is something I did think about a lot in design in a certain way because I wanted Jerry to be sitting in that corner of the couch mm -hmm. like a little boy. And that is exactly like a little tiny kid going, but I, I, but mom, uh, 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 uh. and it's so wonderful as we're zooming in on him and he just looks like this tiny kid who's just stupid. And she is mom. She has grown into this full on woman now who's comfortable in her power and she is sick of him and she is okay to do it. It's almost like 
she has a filter on. She's always been sort of cognizant of his feelings and how she delivers information. But in that moment, there was absolutely no filter. And, you know, we also have to think about that this is in the 80s. Yes. She has to really watch what she says as a woman during this time period. And that character now is like, forget that. I'm going to say my truth. And it's a great place for her character to get to. In Game 4, the clothesline, the impact of it from various angles and that the violence in that moment. How do you take a moment that could be seen as just a foul and capture the iconic energy that's under it? Because it actually changes the entire tone and tenor of the game itself. Mm -hmm. It's not just that moment. Everything changes from there. How do you tell that visually? Again, this is another one of those hard plays because everyone has seen it. So we tackle it like it's an action sequence and breaking it apart in pieces. We knew we wanted to have it, like to really recreate it with TV cameras Mm -hmm. because that's important for us to get that part right. But then it became how do we isolate this in a certain way? And I got to tell you, this is one of those scenes that we have like through the kitchen sink at it. We're going to have a camera low at super high (laughs) speed so we can slow this down. We're going to put the stunt guy. We're going to put the double. We're going to do this. All right, we're going to do one. His head head hit the ground. We're going to do it from the inside the crowd. I I think it's really like we are going to cover the crap out of this thing, which, again, goes to the amazing editors that we have. Yes. Who can now, we've given you all the seasoning. Yeah. How are you going to mix it up? and use it the right way. It seems like the physicality that became a part of the series was almost inevitable. When you think about the differences between the rivalry between Magic and Bird, the long-standing rivalry between the Lakers and the Celtics, that at some point this was going to be more than just a basketball game. How did you capture the momentum from basketball game to violence And have Larry Bird punctuated with, we got him now, like it was almost planned. I think that the Celtics definitely had a plan to get the Lakers out of their normal rhythm. You have those conversations in the locker room. Yeah. We got to get them riled up, get them in the energy. So I think that's the backstory that no one saw. Now, did Bird know that that hit would happen? He did not. The conversation that they had in the locker room before that about let's change the energy of this series. And he already said, Bird had said they need 12 heart transplants and and all of that. So he was looking for something anyway to show some physicality. And all of a sudden it was there. This has now changed everything. We went all the way to recreate it exactly like it happened in real life. You know, whenever we do our stuff from the TV camera and reenact it that way, and then you can jump into it in a different way that people haven't seen, Yes, it really amps up that drama and gives you the feeling that you're talking about. After this cheap shot, there's a lot of basketball. We're telling a different story in a way Mm -hmm. because the game changes. Mm -hmm. Did you talk to the actors and the basketball doubles about the differentiation between just playing basketball and now playing with passion. It's more about reminding the guys while it's happening what the stakes are, you Mm -hmm. know? I mean, I pulled them together before basketball anyway. Right. Because we have a short amount of time. We have a lot to do. I need you to keep your energy up. You remind them of what the stakes are. These are the finals. These are the Celtics. And I need you all to keep your head in the game. Believe me. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't as quite as nice as, no, as I'm know. saying, right? I'm getting nervous. <laughs> Listen, if I don't have a strong hand at certain times, yeah. things are going to just fall apart. And the guys have to know that we have a lot to do. I don't care who you are right now. Stop messing around. It's your face up there. Get your energy going. But, no, it's really, I'm a coach. Yes, you are. Honestly, (laughs) when you're talking about that's what you have to be, you have to come into that huddle, and if if people are getting tired or the intensity isn't there, 
I'm coming in there going, what the hell is going on? Yes. Get your defense together. You look lazy. Get it wow. together. Wow. And I think that the guys always knew where I was coming from. And if you see what the basketball looks like and the intensity that's there, then they're happy now. <laughs> yeah. All the guys on the bench, mm -hmm. when you're on the bench. Yes. It's easy they, to fade. They fade out. Yeah, it's easy to not off. we have five cameras going. Adrian Brody. Yes. Is always acting. Yes, he is. If Adrian who has no lines either and is just walking up and down this court, can keep his energy this whole time, then y'all on this bench better stand up and be in the game. All right. So you can do this with the Celtics actors. Yeah. And you can do this with the Lakers actors. How do you do this with a couple thousand mm -hmm. extras? You know, sometimes to keep all those extras, and I'm not going to say extras, background, our background yeah. actors. Yes, our background actors. Um, they want to be acknowledged for the job that they're doing, too. Mm -hmm. So I take the microphone. Yes, you do. I tell you what's going on, but I also say thank you. I walk over to them and talk to them. I'm telling them exactly what's going on. Well, after I, you scare them, thank you lands <laughs> differently, but continue. People want to be acknowledged. And then every once in a while... When, the, when they're supposed to be reacting to basketball, I play with the ADs, the PAs, and it really gets them going when the director is playing basketball while it's being shot. When our Pat Riley comes into the office and he destroys it, mm -hmm. was there any particular direction you gave him to conjure that energy, or was it just there? You don't have to tell Adrian Brody nothing. Not for that. He was ready to go. In fact, we connected that scene. I said, Adrian, are you okay? We're going to put a camera outside the room, too. We'll shoot inside so that you can tear that room up. And then with that same energy, come straight into the scene yes. to give the speech. And he was like, absolutely thank you because now you don't have to do all this fake stuff in a room to get yourself going he could come right into that monologue and i think it's why that monologue really is so good and hits home because he was able to you know work himself up and use both oh, i feel it too i feel it. i'm burning in your chest pounding in your ears like your heart's ready to explode right through your fucking skull unless you walk out that door across that hall and you bash the fucking light on every one of them before game six Jeannie drives to her dad's mansion pick fair to catch up with them let's listen to their interaction when you bought the team it was the most exciting thing that ever happened to me because it meant I got to spend time with you side by side. That's all I want. It's not, though. You want the picture in the frame to pick it up when it's convenient for you and to put us down when it's uncomfortable. Poor Jerry. <laughs> Clea getting on him, Jeannie getting on him now. <laughs> How do you see the nature of Jeannie and her dad's relationship at this point? You know, for every child, there's a point when you finally see your parents for the human that they are rather than the parent. And that's that moment. Like the real truth, not the fairy tale that I always thought. Right. I really now see you. I see you for who you are. And I am now a woman, mm -hmm. and this doesn't work for me, and I'm not playing into this anymore. But that doesn't mean I don't love you, but something has to change. There's a different dynamic. And I just think that's a g growth of any parent-child relationship at this point. Speaking about another parent-child relationship, after Kareem's dominance in Game 6, we see Bird and his mom. They have their exchange. You want me to be like him? Cheesing for the cameras? I just wish he had some of that joy. You know, that's why Magic is my second favorite player. You can say first. I won't be offended. Well, I guess he will. 
Besides, my first is Bill Lambier. We see a different bird than the bird that we've seen, quite frankly, all season, really. Well, I think it gives us a moment to humanize bird. I mean, just like Magic's mother. Mm-hmm. She knows who her son is. He's going to be the most of who he is, the real him. Yes. The little boy with your mother. And the writers have used the tool of their parents for us to see the real intimate parts of these guys. Mm -hmm. And even though it's just that one scene for Bird, it completely changes how we see him. And it seems like such a simple scene, but it's a really important scene to make Bird's character a full, rounded person rather than just what we see on the court, this sort of caricature yeah. of stoicism, you know? Yeah. So it's an important scene. In the most tense moment of Game 7, Magic and Bird are guarding one another. And once the Celtics win, we have this moment where who do we cheer for in this moment? Do you see a clear hero and a villain in this moment? Uh, no. And that's why that scene with his mom is so important. Mm -hmm. Because I think without that, you don't care about Larry. Yeah. And in the episode that actually Todd directed, where you see where he comes from, so that we do understand and love both of these men in different ways. And you can't just go for magic or go for bird. You see the work ethic of both of these men mm -hmm. on both ends, and you understand why Larry Bird is Larry Bird and why magic is who magic is. So I think that's a wonderful thing that's happened this season, that you aren't just rooting for one guy. Shortly after the game is called, we see Dr. Buss alone in the crowd with a unique look on his face. <laughs> What did you want John C. Riley to be thinking about? What do you think, Dr. Buss? What was his headspace beyond the obvious of losing? Oh, it's just one of those, I don't know, I love that look. It's this, of course these, you know, got yes. us. And yes. I don't even know what that look is on John's face. I don't know what he's feeling, but it's spot on. Oh, it's perfect. Perfect it's like, of course. Yeah, it's like, right, exactly. Yes, of, of course. course that this would happen. Of As course it, I would yeah. lose. You know, <laughs> like I'm looking for this release valve of yeah. hope. Like my team is winning. And of course they're going to lose. Look at this crap. Look at this. Perfectly stated. That last shot where magic is in the shower is a very powerful moment. Mm. Way different than the way season one ended on a high. This is a low on a nasty floor <laughs> with the water coming down. And I like the way you got his feet with the water. <laughs> you know, it wasn't a pretty shower. Love that shot. What do you think it represented beyond just what we see? I think for people in general, sometimes it's good to see the lows oh, yeah. and not just the highs. Yes. Especially because you know the future and yes. that you can come back from there. It's also a scene that we know kind of happened in reality. I guess there's a story about Magic sitting in the shower yes. crying with yes. the water. So we really wanted, even though it's not exactly the same, mm -hmm. we you know, that's what the show tries to do yeah. is capture some of these real moments. For me, I like when people are, don't always win. This is the point when a real man is made. Oh, Lord. So that means I got to lose some more? You got <laughs> <laughs> Man, I can't just be happy. But this isn't about me. This is about thanking you, Sally, for coming in here and spending time with us. And, and I want to, again, personally thank you for everything that you've brought to season two. It truly is an honor to be a colleague and a friend and a low-level family member, I think, at this point. <laughs> because you become that after you fight as much as we do. Thank you again for being on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I just have loved this whole year. It's It's been wonderful to be here working with you and with, with the whole Winning Time family. It's time for the buzzer beater. Today I'm joined by costume designer Emma Potter. Emma, welcome. Thank you for sitting here across from me today. Thank you for inviting me. How do you sort of, because you have so many different worlds to sort of play with, you have the fans in the stands, you have the forum club, 
you have the players. Like, it seems like each one is its own little world that you have to assemble to look a particular way. How does that start? How do you do that? It absolutely is that. And I think it requires a very big team of people that I'm working with and collaborating with. And we all start from a place of research. And that's what's so unique about this project, I think, was that we were able to go and research what did, for example, the Laker girls really look like when Mm -hmm. they first started? What did Magic look like when he first got signed? Like, what did Jerry Buss look like? And so you can kind of dig into videos or photos or read accounts of what these people were like and start from a place of taking the actual visual research that's there. Where does it start? Where does that research start, the detail in that research? I put together these large kind of mosaic, like, lookbooks, let's say. And so in it are photographs that I've pulled from real people in the real place and the real time. And I make these and I share them with all the creative heads and we kind of decide, yes, that's the direction we want to go in. You get those lookbooks that I send out to. And then I pass them along to other people in the team. And then, you know, so there is a background team that goes out and they start acquiring all these garments. It's a huge volume of work to go and pull from rental houses and vintage stores and rag houses. And they bring in, like in the, let's say in the arena, there's what, 1,500 fans at some point in there. We will have looked at every single person. For example, in Boston, if you take the Boston versus L.A., L.A. was very colorful for us. And we had a very kind of golden, shiny glitzy palette that emulated the idea of these people going from there into the forum club. So there was this idea of celebrity and the shine and contemporary of the moment garments that people were wearing. In Boston, we wanted to remove that. It was a lot of a cooler palette. There's obviously more green. We kept out the Lakers kind of gold and purple palette. There was a lot more, I would say, attire that referenced people coming straight from work to go to the games. Right. Like a real kind of blue collar aesthetic, I think, there. Whereas in LA, we were leaning into the beginnings of athletic wear being worn as fashion. And so they would just start dressing them. And then we'd have these little pockets of different types of people that would get placed. And one of my favorite things, like you mentioned, when it's those big background days and you're Mm -hmm. walking through the crowds is to be like, hey, that's the guy from the lookbook. Exactly. (laughs) Like someone has made the exact person. Like someone on my team was like, you, I'm going to make you into this person. And to see it all come together with the hair and the makeup and then the direction is, it's amazing. It's a really fun job. So, Emma, you you mentioned, you know, going out and rummaging across the earth to find these vintage clothes and going from place to place. What would you say is the breakdown between the two of what you have to make and what you have to find? Okay, so for the cast, most of the guys, like everything for Magic and Kareem and Jerry Bass was built. Ah. Uh, For some of the women, it's a lot of vintage clothing. For someone like... Jerry West, I was able to source a lot of vintage Missoni sweaters and things like that, and then we were building other pieces. For Pat Riley, mostly everything was custom-made. All of the uniforms were all custom-made. The background primarily is sourced, um, and that's what we're out kind of rummaging around all across the country for. It's more costumes than I've ever kind of put out before. We were averaging, I think, between 70 to 120 new cast costumes alone every week because every single scene is a different thing. So the volume of it that you're moving through requires you to have both the custom-made clothing for characters that need multiples or just of sizes you can't find in period clothing anymore and then also have a lot of the source garments. It's funny how wardrobe can mean so much to a character. I think about um, Adrian Brody's uh, transition as Pat Riley, where he starts yeah, and then where he ends. So much of his character is dependent upon, that evolution is dependent upon wardrobe. Yeah, he was a wonderful character, an actor to work with to create that character. And um, one of the really exciting things for me was that we were able to work with Armani to Mm. create some of the suits or the suits that you see him wearing in episode eight Mm -hmm. were custom made for him. 
by wow. Armani. And it was great to have that moment of bringing it all together. Like Pat Riley really did wear the Armani suit. He's known for that. And we get to work with Armani and Adrian and build a suit for our Pat Riley. Let's talk about the ladies wear because we have the Forum Club and we have Jeannie Buss and we have the office. How do you factor in the women? Because there's such a a thing that touches on sociology of the times on how women presented themselves in the office place and in the clubs and all of those things. Are you thinking that at the time or is it just trying to duplicate the moment of time that we're in? I think it's a combination of both things. I mean, I think it's so interesting to consider the um, juxtaposition of Claire's approach to dress compared to Jeannie's approach to dress. And, you know, Claire's somebody that very much came up in this kind of staunch working environment in our script that you see in the first season. And she's trying to present herself very seriously to be taken seriously in the workplace. And Jeannie comes in when we first meet her a little bit more liberated. She's still a college student. And her kind of evolution over this season in particular was Mm -hmm. one of my favorites, like the moments where she starts wearing trousers to work, which is groundbreaking. No one else in the office was wearing trousers. And you see that arc from 79 in the beginning. Yeah, You don't see any women in pants at all. And now in 84, yeah, you get that. Yeah. And that was a moment I want to say came about organically talking with Sally at the end of the last season, when you have that scene between Claire and Jeannie Mm -hmm. and Claire's like, no, you're going to be him. And we're like, we wanted to look strong in that. And it, it was trousers. We put her in trousers for it. There's a scene in the office when Jeannie is confronted with the player Mm. and she has a completely new look. And Claire is like, Oh, my God. So that outfit is one of my favorite outfits from this season. I actually found it in between seasons. I was just in a vintage store, and I came upon this actual vintage, unworn pink silk blouse and pant set that were coordinated. And it was a kind of light bulb moment, like this is the perfect outfit for Jeannie at some point in her transition. And I'd been keeping a hold of these looks I'd put on her from both seasons that were too, let's say, like too strong for where she was at certain moments. And so when it came to that scripted beat, I already had this outfit that I'd just been holding on to for the right moment. And I think the strength of all one color, putting her in the heels, the blouse that had a little kind of shoulder detail to it, there was a strength in all of that that was different from what you'd seen before. And it transitioned her into more of like a formal look for the office. Thank you for being you. Thank you for being part of the team. Thank you for coming in here and talking to me. Thank you. A special thank you to our guests, Arthur Jeff Perlman, director and executive producer Sally Richardson Whitfield, and costume designer Emma Potter. And I want to give a special thank you to all the other guests who joined us this season. And a big thank you All of you who have tuned in each and every week, not only to this podcast, but to the most important part, our Winning Time show. I'm Rodney Barnes. It has been such a pleasure. The official Winning Time podcast is a production of HBO, Hyper Object Industries, and Pineapple Street Studios. Our producers are Bria Mariette, Noah Camuso, and Elliot Adler. Darby Maloney is our editor. Our engineers are Harry Nelson, Davey Sumner, and Jason Richards. Our executive producers at Hyperobject Industries are Harry Nelson and Claire Slaughter, with production support from Zaley Mahoney. Our executive producers from Pineapple Street Studios are Gabrielle Lewis and Barry Finkel. Our production music is courtesy of HBO. Special thanks to Michael Gluckstadt and Savon Slater at HBO Podcasts.